Lisa, I love your title. What is a culture strategist? I mean, let's, I, we got a big decision to talk about, but can we just start there? Because I love it. It is a really good title. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity this year of being, uh, this position was sort of created for me. And so when I was speaking to the person who was giving me the position, they said, what do we call you? Um, and we got to have a little brainstorming session around what do I do and how do we call it? And so essentially it's an executive culture strategist. And basically I work with executives um, to look at their current culture what they want to create, what they are creating, and where they want to go, and what the strategy might be that's keeping them from getting where they want to go, what might the strategy be to actually turn a culture completely around if that's um, what they need, or to actually create something that doesn't exist yet. I love that. I bet there's some executives who have just breathed a big sigh of relief after having had a session or two with you, right? Because you kind of come in and you're the how, right? Like I want to take the culture here and you can bring all that wisdom and lessons learned and help them get there. Is that, am I, am I on the right track here? Really yeah, I'm them? the, I'm the why, the what, and the how. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Right. And where's the Venn diagram where all those actually find your sweet spot? Oh, I love that. Well then let's get into like how you got here, right? Because you had an amazing uh, background, very diverse all over the world. Um, but let's talk about a decision you and your family were making a few years ago about an opportunity that arose in the UK because it, it was a huge opportunity, but it came with at least what seemed to be a price tag associated with it. It was, some, it was a real decision, right? And so can you give yeah. us some context around what, what, what led up to it and, and, and some of the thinking around it? Yeah, at the time, my husband was uh, working with Dell and was given a really exciting opportunity to go to the UK and work with some of the people there. And he had wanted to live abroad before, and so had I. And this opportunity came, and he was so excited about it. And he felt like, I feel like this is the thing that we need to do, but I wanted, I want everyone to be on board with it. I don't want to drag people across the globe. Okay. And so as a family, we sat down, we talked about it. At the time, we had two kids. Um, our youngest was nine, and our eldest was 12. And so they were pretty formative ages. And so after weeks of discussion and conversation, the kids got on board and I got on board and we were packing our suitcases and ready for our new adventure to the UK. And at the time I had just started my own business in the U S and it was going right. really well. Yeah. And it was really mostly through relationships and network and grassroots. I was doing zero advertising, zero marketing. I was just getting word of mouth from my clients who, you know, were really enjoying the work that we had done together. And so I kind of had this, I'll make it work. I'll figure it out. Um, and so we moved to the UK and we were living there and everyone was acclimating really well. And I was having to sort of try to live on one continent raising two adolescent, you know, kids yeah. and work yeah. on another continent. Um, and I was pretending like that was working for a little while until I couldn't pretend any longer that it wasn't. No, I get that because, you know, that term double shift is becoming very prevalent as it should be, but that's double shifting to a whole, on a whole other level, right? I mean, very intense. Yeah, yeah, it was very intense. And I finally, after, I think I had had a couple of months with so much travel and trying to stay connected and trying to be in, you know, so many different time zones that I, I kind of came to the decision where I was like, I can't do this. Okay. Um, okay. And my priorities and we were very big as a family on what's most important and what do we prioritize? Because when we know what we prioritize, we know what we say no to, we know what we say yes to. Right. And yeah. my kids were my hundred percent. Yes. At that season of my life. And so after a lot of conversations, I made the decision to actually let go of my business, give all my business away, completely close down what I had spent years building and was actually yeah. having growth and momentum at the time. Well, let's talk about that because um, in hindsight, right, that's such a 2020, that was such a good decision and we'll talk about why, but let's go back to a moment because um, one of the things we talk about here in, in Courageous Decision or Courageous Decisions is that decisions, these big moments can be choppy, messy, full of second thinking and thoughts and regrets and did I make the right decision? I mean, because you're giving away 
a lot of money. You, you, I mean, relationships you built trust with. I mean, how? Did, let's just dig into that. How did it go when you start telling your clients in the U.S. that hey, yeah. um, little change here? I was scared to be really honest. Um, okay. There was a, there was a, a, a small part of me, and I think it was at the very core of me that knew this was the right decision. Yeah. Um, my personal core, I knew it was the right decision. Right. Everything else was screaming at me, like, are you crazy? Yeah. You've worked so hard for this. Right. People are going to hate you. You're going to ruin your reputation. Like, I mean, I was very afraid. And really, luckily, I had very gracious clients. And some of them I was in the middle of pretty large initiatives with, and they were large projects. Nice. But once I explained to them, this has been a very difficult decision, and this is my why. Yeah. And it's just not something that's uh, negotiable. They completely understood. And I was able to uh, connect them with other colleagues and um, other friends that do the same work that could carry on the work that they were doing and help them bring it to completion and success. Right. And with the exception of one client, one client was really angry and it was 100% about them and they were unable to see my why or okay. find any value in it. Um, and I felt like that was a bridge that was not mine to burn, but if they chose to burn it, I was going to be gracious about it. Um, the rest of my clients were actually very understanding. Okay. How much mental headspace did that one angry client take up? Um, a lot in the okay. early days, okay. a lot, especially yeah. when I went from running my own business and working and doing work I loved to living in a country that I didn't know very many people. I didn't right. have a lot of friends. Right. Um, my husband and kids had all these amazing things to do. And I was sat there going, what do I do now? Um, yeah. Was that one angry client triggering any fear, doubt, insecurity? Like this was oh. just so... It, it was like, uh, I don't know, it was like, it was like all that resistance you were receiving, was that triggering in any way as you were, as you were trying to unwind this? And, and Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was left with that. And, and now in retrospect, I can look back and go, wow, my clients were really gracious and they were really beautiful. And that yeah. was what I was feeling in the moment. I was like, people hate me. Wow. My clients are really angry at me. How in the world am I going to build a business in a country where I'm a foreigner? I know no one. I have yeah. no network. Yeah. And the work that I do is not common in this country. So what was I thinking? So I had a ton of regret and feelings of, did I do the right thing? And should I not have done this? And my husband and I had been in a pattern through all of our career where we kind of co-parented really beautifully, where there would be seasons where it felt like his career really needed to be the priority. And then that would mean that my career would step back just a little bit so I could be available for the kids. And then there were times when my career felt like it needed the attention. Yeah. And so we put it at the forefront and he would take a position where he could step back and be more available to the kids. And so this was one of those seasons where it did feel like his, his career was taking priority and that was fine. We'd done that a couple of times already, yeah. um, but to be in the abyss of nothing yeah. and to have the residual anger from that one client really caused me to be stuck and kind of frozen for a little yeah, while. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because uh, first of all, I love the way you describe your relationship with your husband since it was a you know, beautiful partnership there. And you guys, sounds like you guys have built the trust up to like, hey, you take the baton, now I take the baton, then you yeah. take the baton because you're on the same team team, which I think is so beautiful. With that being said, he's got a full-time job in the UK. Your kids are in school. You're trying to unwind. Did, did it feel lonely at all? Was it, was oh. it, this for like, how much could you share with, with the rest of the team, so to speak, your family? And how much did you just have to absorb this on, on your own, I guess? Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question because yes, it was very lonely and I didn't share any of it with my kids because I didn't want them to feel like I had sacrificed something important to me right. because of them and it wasn't worth it. I didn't want that message to be portrayed right. to them by any means. Um, and so really, and at the time I had no intimate friends because I was a foreigner living in a new country where I didn't really know anyone. Yeah. Um, so it was really just my husband. And I tried to temper some of it as well because I also didn't want him to feel guilty. Like, oh, I asked you to take too far a step back. And this step back is going to completely destroy your career, which at the time I felt, and I felt it alone. Yeah, I carried right? that yeah. alone of like, I might have just absolutely destroyed the career that I love and that I've worked really hard to build. 
and I'm not really sure where to go from here. No, I love that. The word that's coming up for me is grief. I, I don't know if that's yeah. true. It seemed like there was some grief involved. There was a lot of loss, yeah. especially, you know, as an entrepreneur. So my family was entrepreneurs. We Entrepreneurship was in my blood. This was something I had built right. myself. I built it from nothing. Yeah. And it was successful and I had a reputation and I had, you know, a lot of momentum around it. And then just to have nothing was really hard. What did that do to your, um, how much of your identity at that point in time was, was tied up into this um, entrepreneurial role or the, this, this career? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really at that different. point in time, all of it. Right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I think that I think I didn't know that at the time. Okay. I think that I at the time I was I was at a stage where I felt like I'm very well balanced and I have a lot of these things. But it's interesting. It was during that time that I recognized I am not just what I do. Like there's a whole there's a whole layer here that I probably need to explore. And it was actually during that season that I discovered mindfulness um, as a way of like reconnecting with like, who am I when there's nothing out here to connect to? I have to connect internally to find that groundedness. So it was actually mindfulness that really allowed me to notice more deeply and broadly how much my identity was tied up in what I did. I love that. And so now you're sitting in the UK and you finally have unwound the US business, which from a practical perspective must have been, I imagine, pretty freeing because you don't have the six to eight hours in the evening. Most people are winding down. You have to go run a major sprint every night. Um, what, what, um, what were your options at that point? Like, what, what were you, because what, what, what was, were you thinking about rebuilding? Was that the natural next best step? Did you just sit in it for a while? Like, I would just love to see what happened when it was all like, okay, that was the last call. Yeah. I mean, I essentially, once I got through that, it was a few months. And then I was like, all right, what do I do now? Do I try to actually build something. And if I try to build something here, A, I've got to figure out what wants to be built because I don't know enough about how business is done. I don't have a deep enough network here. Like I need to do some kind of recon or something. Yeah. I need to get out. I need to meet people. I need to network. I need to ask questions in order just to even understand if I could begin to build something that was at all, you know, compatible with the market. And so um, I started to do a little bit of research. I started to connect with a few people that I knew that were in um, executive positions in England and in companies and just started asking a lot of questions. Can I take you to dinner? Can I just pick your brain a little bit? Um, and then I started to I then started to get the momentum of, I think I could build something here that looks very different. And I think I have a skill set here that could meet a gap that doesn't exist. And so I then went back into my US network and started reaching out to people individually and said, I think I'm ready to start trying to find some clients in the UK. Do you have anyone in UK or Europe? Yeah. You know, that is X, Y, Z. I had kind of determined who I thought was probably a pretty ideal client to begin with. Um, and if so, would you be willing to connect me and introduce me so that I could just have a conversation? And so those early conversations really became a lot of my research, my market research, my understanding. Um, but they actually then ended up being built into relationships where a few of them actually did become some of my first clients. I love that. One of my favorite quotes is Lauren Rubis, which is the conversation is the relationship. Hundred percent. Right, and so you're just having these conversations, and you're furthering relationships, and building relationships, and taking people out to dinner, and learning the marketplace. But you were still a pioneer, though, right? I mean, you were still a little bit of a forerunner. Like the UK didn't have quite the same. Uh, um, what's what I'm looking for? Like point of view, or attitude, or ex exposure to this type of leadership development. Is that definitely? Correct? And especially in those in those years, it was very very early days. Yeah. Um, and I think at the time, executive coaching was sort of seen as this strange thing that was coming from America that we're not entirely sure what to do with. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was also kind of 
beginning to recognize that. And so part of what I was leveraging, I was kind of beginning to expand it beyond just executive coaching to understanding a little bit more around organizational design and organizational development and team dynamics and cross-cultural interactions and some of those pieces. So I was broadening at the time, I was really having to broaden my offering, um, which was actually really beautiful because I was able to offer at that point, a lot more holistic kind of services to the executives and entrepreneurs that I was working with there. Yeah, it was like, it feels like it was like getting a master's degree in international relations, poli sci, <laughs> business. It was like, I mean, you have created your own, yeah. Cause I know you built a business in Dubai, you built a business in the UK, you built a business in the United States, you probably built business elsewhere as well. But my point is like, it seems like each chapter added some incredible skills and some incredible nuance to, to your, your methodology. Absolutely. And I think I, I love how you said that because I think the reality is, and I don't know, I, I work with a lot of women executives and men executives. So I notice there's a difference, but I think, um, I think if a human of any kind at any level is willing to really make that courageous decision, yeah. whatever that courageous decision is, take that risk. Um, it always, there's always a risk of failure. There's always a loss. There's always that sort of liminal space between the thing that I had and the thing that isn't here yet. Uh, and that space yeah. Yeah. is really scary. Yeah. But if people are willing to step into that space, they almost always propel themselves forward, propel their learning, propel their growth, propel their development, their career, whatever it is that is in the space that they've taken the risk. And I, I rarely hear people say, I took this risk and it just wasn't worth it. I don't I know, know that I've ever heard very many conversations like yeah. that. I haven't either. And I love that you're going there because I think like to have the price you ultimately want, I think, I mean, to have the life you ultimately want, you got to pay a price for it in some level, right? And it's those, it's in that gap that you pay the price, right? And you face all your fear, doubts, insecurities. You're stretched like there before. It's super uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds super uncomfortable. I'm Very. Well, so I emotionally <laughs> connect to what you're saying. Um, and I love that. So you come, but, but you were there as expats, right? You were in the UK sure. as full time. So sooner or later, you came back to the US. What was the story like then? When, when, because did you have to go through the same experience in, in, in unwinding something or was there a different set of options that presented themselves when you? Yeah. Well, it's there? interesting because we had gone to the UK the first time for 18 months. Um, right. And that was when I had kind of unwound everything. And then when we came back to the US, I sort of kept some of the clients that I had in the UK because I felt like, I don't know, I just feel like I'm not supposed to unwind there. Okay. I'm supposed to kind of keep that running. And as much as I could keep it running, I did. And so luckily, because I only had a few, I hadn't built like a massive anything there. Yeah. Um, we came back to the US for three years and I was able to pick up business quite easily again in the US because my network was really um, broad and deep. And then three years in, we decided to return to the UK again. Oh, interesting. And at that point in time, my daughter was 17 and my son was 14. And they were like, yes, we want to return. And so when we returned the second time to the UK was when I was like, okay, I'm going all in. I'm going to make this work. Yeah. Um, and I was able to actually then leverage the little bit that I had done in that scary place and actually build out a really broad and diverse set of clients and contracts and was doing better work than I'd ever done before um, in the UK as an expat. I love that because you got to capitalize on momentum that you'd seeded years earlier, right? Years earlier, yeah. seeded your momentum, taking the risk, paid the price, and now you got to have a second go around with it. Maybe you're still going, I don't know, but it's, it's awesome. Um, last question for you is around, I feel like you've, you've touched on it. Is that still inner voice, right? Your, your logic, your logical brain, your, your, you know, your flesh is screaming at you. What are you doing? But you had that inner, I don't know what you call it, voice, spirit, um, guide. I don't know what you call it, but can we talk a little bit about that? Like, how do you know, like, how do you know when you, when you, when it, it, what does that feel like to you? Like, how, how, how can you anchor yourself in something that seems so mystical in some ways, but you just know? Yeah, I call it my intuition. Yeah. Um, and my whole life, I've had a really strong intuition. It's just that gut feeling yeah. um, that, like, I know because I know. 
And I'm actually a very logical person. And I'm like, normally it's like, I'm making this decision because A, B, and C, and I've, you know, measured the pros and cons. And this is the logical conclusion that I come up with. And this is why it's the right decision. Um, I do make those decisions most often. These kinds of like courageous decisions, those risk taking decisions, I never make logically ever. Um, <laughs> anytime I've taken a major risk, it's yeah. always been that gut intuition. And so I think that there's, I think at the end of the day for me, and I don't know about for other people, but because I make such logical decisions with my mind, if my gut tells me to do something, I trust it instantly. Yeah. I can't explain why it's not logical. Usually in retrospect, I can absolutely unwind it and create this absolutely. like exactly yeah. what's happening. Yeah. Um, but it's just a, I know because I know and I trust myself. I love that. I'm the same way. I just have that little pain. Sometimes it's a still small voice. It's not screaming at me. It's just that little thread that I pick up on. You know, yeah. and I'm like, oh yeah, I, need, I know what I need to do next, and and it makes sense to me. Yes. Do you protect that a lot? I guess I'm saying last question. Um, I could ask you five last questions because we could go for three hours. <laughs> I love this. Um, but but how do you protect that still small voice? Because you kind of was necessarily log like you said, looking backwards, you can explain it, rationalize it, demonstrate it, the whole nine yards. But at the moment, you may not have a lot of logical or tangible evidence to show someone. It's just that gut feeling. Is do you protect it? Is there some wisdom about who you share it with, when you share it? Like, how do you how do you navigate those early stages of that that um, intuition? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things that I do. I trust it, and I usually try to amplify it. I don't actually try to protect it. I try to amplify it because I notice with my personality, the more I let it speak, the more I give space to it, the more real it feels to me. The more I'm able to trust it. Um, I think if there was a protection or a way that I guarded, um, I think that season of my life when I started getting into mindfulness and I really started practicing meditation and feeling far more centered and grounded in that like really still space, the quiet space where there's no voice yeah. that now combines with sort of my loud intuition and the partnership of the two of those allow me to make a lot riskier decisions that don't feel quite as risky anymore.